Welcome back to the Changemaker Podcast. I'm your host, Deke Copenhaver, with a little bit of a voice issue. So I'm glad that I have a great guest today that can do a lot of talking, and that guest would be Heather Parody. Heather is a mental health therapist turned online entrepreneur where she helps outside-the-box leaders bring their services online in order to scale their impact. She has hosted multiple top-ranking shows, including the Heather Parody Show, which I love to be a guest on. Um, and conducted over a 1,000 interviews to date. She's been featured in Forbes, Pop Sugar, and most importantly, in front of her mom's refrigerator. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Heather Parody. Welcome to the Changemaker Podcast, hosted by Deke Copenhaver. Deke is the author of The Changemaker, a Forbes publishing book that has reached number one on Amazon on multiple occasions and in multiple categories like management skills and total quality management. During this podcast, Deke interviews exceptional change-making leaders. Deke currently operates Copenhaver Consulting, where he helps local governments and other public organizations maximize their potential. He's also a sought-after public speaker. We hope that the change maker has an impact on you today and that you find takeaways that make you a better leader in your life. Now, here's Deke. Thanks for having me. I'm super happy to be here. And I think I need to check my mom's fridge and make sure my picture hasn't been taken down. Oh, really? It's probably replaced with all the grandkids at this point. Oh, no. Yeah. She, she's got to put it back. I'm telling you, man, it's like you start having kids and it's like you're just not important anymore to the parents. It's just like, well, your time's gone. Bring well, she, that sugar in here. She can do like a Hall of Fame. <laughs> I guess so. And you're like the <laughs> initial member in that Hall of Fame. I, I think I like that. So, Heather, thank you for being here. This is, you are the second person to do the show twice now. Really? So, yes. You're, you're very Thank special you. and very Thank important. Thank you. And I've had you on twice, too. And it's not going to be the last time because my husband said you were the best interview that he's heard. That that last interview that we did is by far and away my favorite interview mm. that I've ever done. And it's it's interesting. Lou Diamond, good friend of mine who's podcasting legend, but he listened to it and he was like, "If obviously if I get my voice back, this will make an impact. But he said... That is the guy that I want to hire to come speak mm. because you guys were not preachy. Yeah. You were just so authentic. And I think that that really resonated with my wife. Mm. Um, my wife was like, well, what, what does Heather do? And all this, <laughs> she's got a great voice. We listened to it yesterday, but just for our listeners, once again, you, you come from, you know, a small town, you grew up in, a, you know, in Arkansas, I believe. Mm-hmm. So how did, Small town Heather Parody, mm-hmm. who was a quirky little kid. <laughs> How did you get to where you are now? I'm still getting to where I'm going. You Me hear what too. I'm saying, man? Me too. So let's just talk about that real quick. But, um, man, I just knew from an early age that God had a call in my life. Yep. And uh, I was just talking to our mutual friend over here, and communication is just really important to me. Um, I don't have a lot of talents. I always was jealous of people who had all the talents who could sing and dance and build things and do stuff. But I was just for the people and would yeah. yap my mouth off to them. Uh, at first, I thought that was going to manifest through ministry. I was yeah. really, really involved in ministry for a long time, um, really into adulthood. Um, and at some point, I decided to go to school and become a therapist and help people that way. I'm fast forwarding through this really, really fast. The, I just, the point of it is the undertone of it all has just been about how can I help people? Yeah. How can I use the tools in my hand to reach people and love people? Um, on my way to school, I would just start listening to all these podcasts and consuming a lot of content. Mm-hmm. And it exposed me to a world that I wasn't aware of. Like I knew that, God could do things and I knew that things could change and et cetera, et cetera. But for some reason, listening to people on microphones, just like this through different mediums, just really started shifting my mindset of like, Oh, Oh, like we can really shift stuff in our lives if we want to, like there's a no cap to like our growth potential. And so I started putting out my own media and just kind of documenting what I was learning. Uh, That was about, that was probably close to six, seven years ago. And by the time I graduated, got my license, did all that stuff, I went crying to my husband and said, I don't think I want to get a job. <laughs> I want to, and he's like, oh God, Lord, here she goes. Um, I want to start my own business. I'm going to start my own thing. I want to put out my own media. I want to do what these other people have done. And so um, now we're working with leaders all over who are wanting to bring their services online. I think the online space can destroy people. Yeah. And I think it can save people. And I want to be in the group of people that are saving people through 
media through their products, through their services, using their voice. Yeah. Um, that's the simple way of explaining what I do. Well, it's, it's to me, you know, it's the same thing. I have a calling on my life. Let's go. And it's really to bring people together on common ground. Mm -hmm. And I've done that. I did that for nine years in office. I did it through my book. I do it through the podcast. I do it through speaking engagements, coaching. But I know that that's what God has called me to do. Yeah. And to identify the common ground issues that we all have. And I've often said that in leadership roles, sometimes to find common ground, you've got to become the common ground. Oh, boy. But it's just, it's like <laughs> the people that I bring on to, I was listening to a podcast with a friend of mine who loved yours as well. But he's like, you have a lot of really smart people on your podcast. Mm. He said, but nobody's arrogant. Mm. It's just good people that want to make a difference in the world. And I'm like, that's the whole point. There's so many people like yourself and myself out there. And I always say, I'm just an old hippie at heart. I'm just trying to unite the tribes. I love that. And you're part of my tribe. Let's go. Yeah. You know what you said that was really powerful, and I want to underline it, is you said that, you know, your your calling was to connect people and yep. to be a bridge, right? I know for me, I've gotten really caught up in my calling, meaning I'm a podcast host. I have this as a business. Yeah. I do this, 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 when really that's just the tool, like the through line of it all, what that's your calling, right? Yeah. And throughout different seasons, things change and adjust. And I felt like such a you know, an idiot, you know, when I was like, I'm going to walk away from spending years learning therapy yeah. to walk away and do this thing. Yeah. But God just really had to like release me of that, of saying, not, not what is your overarching calling of your life to do forever. It's like, what is your calling in this season? Yeah. You know, and usually the through line stays the same, but our avenues and our tools are just. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, and I think that the Lord puts a calling on everybody's life, mm -hmm. whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. But I think particularly in today's world, there are so many distractions. And every day I pray, I'm like, Lord, help me help us, your people, to seek your face and your voice. Because yeah. I do think we can get awfully distracted, you know, by social media, by being bombarded with different messages. So it, it takes being intentional to really try to listen for God's voice. And even so, I always would tell people, I'm like, it never fails that something it's during Lent for me. Hmm. My last year in office, it was the ice storm that crippled Augusta. I'm like, yeah, it happened during Lent. Mm. And there was an earthquake after that. But I'm like... In Augusta, there was an earthquake? Yeah, there was an earthquake. Shoot, when was that? What year was that? Oh, it was 2014. Oh, I was right before I got here. Goodness yeah, sakes, I had known you, that. You missed Lord. it. You missed it. But, uh, but, so I lost my voice like when Lent hit. And I'm like, Lord... I know that you're using even this for a reason. And it's kind of like, I'm like, okay, I was kind of like you. I'm like, I'm not a great musician. I'd love to be a great singer, guitar player. But like a month ago, I'm like, wait a minute. My voice is my instrument. Come on. God, thank you for giving me my voice. But I know that he's using this incident yeah. of my voice being impact. It darn sure makes you appreciate the voice you've got. But that's one of the things, as I say, that my wife said about you listening to the podcast yesterday. Heather has a great voice. Well, it's nice hearing that. Um, I was really insecure for a variety of reasons using it. Yeah. Um, you know, you can do kind of like the more ego stuff. Like, I don't want the way it sounds. I sound like a country hick, you know, all yeah. that stuff. But when you really get down to the, like the root and the core of it, it's like I am judging what I have to say. I wonder if it has value. Yeah. I wonder if it adds to this space. There's so many people who are doing X, Y, Z. Yeah. Um, and I think that's been a thing that I've really had to navigate and, and God has just had to open my heart with of like trusting that what yep. he gave me was enough yep. and not to judge and want more. And just being really, really faithful for what is in your hand. Because it's not, a, I can't control the outcome. I can't control how many people listen. I can't control, only I can do is show up and yeah. be faithful and do it and release it. And then my work is done. Yeah. That sounds easy, but it's really, really hard to do. Yeah. Because we want to be special, <clears throat> right? We yeah. want to do something that's meaningful, but we can't control that. All we can do is control showing up. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's funny. My wife, we were in New York back in December and she said, you know, we just have to look at what you do as a ministry. And mm. it is, you and I discussed on the podcast, <laughs> I'm like, it's not being a doctor or a lawyer yeah. or, you know, the typical professions. Most people I know 
have done extremely well in. It is, it's a different calling that we have, yeah. <clears throat> but what a beautiful calling. And, and with every show you do, and I think you hit the nail on the head, what leadership is, it's wanting to help people. Mm -hmm. And just knowing that you're touching people's lives through what you do and what yeah. you say and what your guests say, that's about as cool of a calling, I think, as anybody could ever have. I think so. I hope so. I, Well, and it's, you and I are punk rock fans too, right? <laughs> we, so we always have to talk about punk rock. Yeah. But it's kind of like, I grew up, you know, thinking it's good to challenge authority and the status mm -hmm. quo. Mm -hmm. And so part of what I do is really in that bent mm -hmm. because I think the status quo is polarization and is trying to tear people apart. And so I think rebelling against the status quo of polarization mm -hmm. is really, really cool. Do you think that's like your biggest, um, when you say status quo, you, the first thing you said was polarization. Is yeah. that how the one that just irks you more than anything? It, it is okay. because, and we discussed on, on your podcast, it's impacting, you know, religion, churches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, listen to this. This is crazy. So, and I don't think we talked about this on the last show, but researching for my new book, you know, um, and I know your husband's military, mm -hmm, correct? Mm -hmm. So be having been mayor of Augusta for nine years, I'm like, we're home to Fort Gordon. I had a great relationship with the military. You know, everybody trusts the military. So the Ronald Reagan Institute does a yearly poll to see what the trust, trust level is in the, in the military. Mm. So they did it in December of 2022, the last one. It's 48% mm. of the American people which is three percentage points up from uh, the prior year, but it's down from 70% five years ago. So, and people don't trust the military because they think it's polarized. And so basically it's divided. Liberals think that the military has white extremists in it. Mm. And then conservatives think that there are too many woke policies in the military. But I'm like, whatever the case may be, you know, if people don't trust our nation's military, which has historically been the most trusted institution within our government, that's a problem. So this polarization, as I say, it's impacting religion. It's impacting our government. It's in the media, but it's just not good. And we serve a uniting God. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that that's what we're called to do is to be uniters, not dividers. You said something really interesting. I'm going to pull it back in. Okay. Earlier, you said that you felt like your calling, your calling is to connect people. Yep. Right? Yep. Then you also said the thing that irks you more than anything is division. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because often our calling, right, is laying right next to like our biggest yeah. irk. Because the thing that you notice in the world, you notice it for a reason, right? Yeah. Like, there are so many people out there who are probably like, polarization, yeah, it's an issue, but this thing really bothers me. Yeah. This is the thing. <clears throat> what do you think their calling is, right? So yeah. it's like if you don't know what your calling is or you wrestle with it, think about what moves you yeah. more than anything else. Well, and it, it's interesting. At a church service recently, we talked about wrestling with God. And it's okay to wrestle with your calling and with everything. And I, I meant to thank the minister because I'm mm -hmm. like, it is if you're really – called to something and it's different and it's not typical of what other people are doing, Yeah, you know, it kind of can set you off on an island at times. <laughs> but I think through that wrestling and through, you know, that builds your faith. And it's kind of yeah. like, okay, am I really supposed to do this? I'm mm -hmm. 55 years old. Mm -hmm. Am I still supposed to be, you know, I've spent nine years in office trying to bring yeah. people together. But I think God's calling is bigger than this local community for me. Yeah. And I think I'm called to do it at an even greater level. So I'm I'm doubling down. How about that? You said 55? Yeah. God, you got so much laugh in you. <laughs> you know, Tom Cruise, he's like, what is he? He's I think he's 54 and he's jumping out of airplanes and doing crazy yeah. stuff. So no, come on, he's man. older than me. Is he? Yeah. I don't know how old he is, but listen, if, you, if Tom Cruise jumped out of planes, your turn. Okay. Your turn. I'll, I've got something. Don't jump out of a plane. No, I did not well, say that. I've already done that one time. Oh, I wouldn't ever do that. And somebody, mm -hmm. somebody said, well, you're going to get addicted to skydiving? No. So no. I did it, and it was you, I jumped. It wasn't a tandem jump. It was like two people, one person on either side. 
and they started pointing at my altimeter. And your What's sponge, your altimeter? What's what? It keeps your altitude. <laughs> oh, okay. And it's on your chest. I was like, I didn't know we had one of those. And they're like, you're supposed to pull the ripcord at a certain altitude? <laughs> well, I'm just looking around going, man, this is so cool. This is so cool. So they had to pull my rip coat, oh. my rip cord. So needless to say, I never went uh, skydiving God. again. Brave, dude. Brave. But I've got something really cool. And, and so I've told you my life is like Forrest Gump. So I have never been, us being, you know, music fans, I've been invited to South by Southwest for a founding partners gathering for Starts With Us that we Let's discussed. Go. That's awesome. I'm so psyched. I've never been to start with um, to South by Southwest. And Austin is like one of my favorite places. I got to introduce you to somebody who's going to be speaking there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's really cool. I'm glad you're going to do that. So my goal in the future is, to speak at South by Southwest. It's done. Yeah, well. Done. If you can believe it, you can do it. And if God intends for you to do it, nobody can stop it from happening. Intention. I was just listening to, a, um, I don't know how you feel about Oprah Winfrey, but I just, I think she has some really, I, I love her her focus on intention. And she, not only did she have like an intention with her <clears throat> show, but she says that anytime she goes into an engagement or um, a meeting or anything, yeah. it's like, what's the intention here? Tell me the intention because she has found that intention is so powerful because it literally moves things yeah. on your behalf. So that's your intention. If it yeah. really is, back it, out of the way, y'all. It is. The universe is going to move. It is. And I'll tell you, because you and I discussed this on your show, mm -hmm. that people will say from a marketing standpoint, you know, you need to be controversial or whatever and all this. And I'm like, mm -hmm. look at Rick and Oprah. Mm -hmm. Look at the following that Oprah has. Mm -hmm for doing good stuff, mm -hmm. you know? So in the media, it's kind of like, well, if it bleeds, it leads. I'm like, yeah. o Oprah's not, you know, turning over dead bodies or anything. Correct. So I think there's, if I think if you provide people with light in a dark world, they'll go to it. Yeah. So what are your, th what are your thoughts? Yeah, that's, that's the thing I've <clears throat> really struggled with over the past couple of years from like a branding as anybody I've ever worked on. They're like, well, you need, to have a strong opinion and draw yeah. a line in the sand and like, rah, and I'm like, I do have a strong opinion, yeah. but also too, like, you know how your through line is uh connection. Mine's belonging, Yeah, you know, cause my biggest pain, my biggest wound is always, and I, you know, if you look at psychology and different theorists, a lot of them will say, you know, what is your biggest wound? You have to be really open yeah. and honest about that. And again, that's your calling. Yeah. So belonging was always my thing of, of feeling like an outsider, an outcast and all that. So if for me to go in and like make other people feel like an outcast, feel like they don't belong, that goes against yeah. like my core values yeah. and what mm. I dealt with. So it made no sense to me. And I've just really had to just call BS on that and say yeah. like, why am I allowing you to set the rules of this, of my life, of yeah. what it's supposed to look like? You're telling God is so small that he can't move in my life unless I'm controversial. Yeah. Like, come on, man. <laughs> um, so I've just, I've just revolted away from that message. I think that you, I know that you can make, like you said, bold statements and stand for something, but do it in a spirit and a heart. Yeah. Um, and your intention is to bring people together and you can hear it a little differently. Right, like somebody can come in and, and get on to us and be like, you know, this room doesn't need to, this table doesn't need to be right here, blah blah yeah. blah blah blah. Somebody else can come in and say like, hey, this table needs to be moved over here, et cetera, et cetera. And you're saying the exact same thing, and you're saying yep. it in two completely different ways. Yeah. So it's not about what you're saying; it's like the intention and the delivery. I yeah. think that we can be a little more creative with, um, and to sit with creative for a minute. What if there's an opportunity for us as leaders to be creative in the way that we deliver stuff and use that yeah. as like a, um, a fun challenge of like, hey, I want to talk about X, Y, Z. Traditionally, this is a controversial topic. How can I step up my leadership game, be a little more creative yeah. using humor, using analogies, yes. using story, X, Y, Z, using media? Yeah. You know, it, it limits us. Well, you know, I've, I've always said that I think creativity is a huge part of leadership. So I grew up writing and painting and writing poetry. So having exposure to the arts created in me the ability to, um, I learned creative problem solving. And I think that's like in politics, it's a zero sum game. Yeah. It's either this way or that way. Yeah. But as an artist, you're like, okay, let's come at it from every different angle. And maybe it's not just black or white. Yeah. So I think, 
those creative skills make you a better leader. Yeah. You know, um, I was at a conference last year. I can't believe, I can't remember if I told you this or not, so forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but, um, I was a speaker and you get one of those little speaker sheets and it said, you know, like so-and-so speaker, so-and-so speaker, so-and-so. And it was like an agenda. So I'm sitting there looking at it and in between each speaker, um, there was an artist. So like a singer, there was this girl doing sign language, there was this dancer, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. And next to their name, it said transition. Okay. So you had speaker, 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 transition act, speaker, yeah. speaker, speaker, <laughs> et cetera. Every time, granted, the speakers were awesome. Okay, good speech. Because you were one. A hundred percent. No, they were great. But every time one of the artists got up there, I was like moved, like soul. I mean, it, it was a, there was a comedian. I mean, like there, it wasn't necessarily they were singing some deep song. There was just something spiritually and energetically when the artist got up there that I was like, wow, they are they're speaking to us without speaking to us. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And God really clearly spoke to me and said that the artists are the healers yeah, <clears throat> and that we use art and creativity to heal. Right. And so it, it's not about, again, you and I don't have singing talent. I don't know. Maybe we can work on that. Right. <laughs> it's not about the way we traditionally think of creativity, yeah. but I think if we invite creativity into our lives and ask God, Hey, help me think through this creatively. And so if we're actually inviting the spirit of healing in yeah. our work, because that's what it does. You know, it's, it's interesting though. What, so I always, when I write, I try to write things. And when I speak where people can read themselves into it. Mm. So on my first book, it was very interesting. So, you know, uh, it was the change maker, the art of building better leaders. But when I first put it out, somebody said, well, what's at the core of your book? Mm. And I said, well, that in leadership positions, even in politics, you can maintain your character and integrity and treat everybody with dignity and respect mm. and still be successful. Yeah. And the guy goes, man, I can't wait to read it because I don't think that's possible. Woo. But when it first came out, I had a lady who I know I had a speaking engagement for Leadership Augusta. And she came up to me afterwards. She's African-American female, um, vice chair of the Democratic Party. She said, I loved your book. My 18-year-old daughter loved your book. Yeah. And you need to run for office again. And I would vote for you even if you ran as a Republican. <laughs> So that same week, a guy locally that knows former President Trump that was a staunch supporter came up to me and was like, man, I just love your book and all this. Mm. I'm like, mm. that, that, if you guys can agree that you like the book, yep. don't you think that you could have yep. some sort of a conversation around it? I know. But I think that that's just being creative. But that is exactly what you say. Art, music, these are things that unite us, that bring us together. 100%. And you and I have discussed, I mean, if you go to a concert – you're not asking anybody what their politics are. Yeah. You know, it's like I was talking to a friend of mine, Dob Barron, about going to a Neil Diamond concert. And, you know, he's like, at the end of the night, everybody's singing, Sweet Caroline, ba, ba, ba. And he's like, it's just this communal, beautiful moment. Yeah. So I agree completely with you. I think that that's, that's why God put art into the world. Yes. Yeah. And again, I want to like encourage anyone who feels like, well, I'm not an artist because I've had that frustration too. I think one of the lowest hanging fruits with art is storytelling and yeah. we can, anybody can learn storytelling. I mean, yeah. Even practice with your kids. You know what I mean? Like uh, listen to good storytellers. Think about how can I tell a story here? Mm -hmm. um, story worthy. I don't know if you've read it. It's an incredible book by I'm Matthew not. Dix. Now he does like competitive <clears throat> storytelling stuff. So it's not applicable to everybody. <clears throat> But I think that's a really low hanging fruit to introduce like creativity into your life. So the first book I ever wrote was for my niece, Jane, when she was born, when I was nine years old and I went to Winn-Dixie and I got like a folder that had lily pads all over it and wrote my book, the frog, the frog and the princess. Hmm. And so I, she still has that book that's to cool. this day. That's sweet. But yeah, but no, it's, you know, I, I just, Art brings people together, and I'm all for, maybe it's my passion against extremism or polarization, but I'm all about doing things that can bring people together. Yeah. And I think even this podcast is part of that endeavor. I'm trying to join the voices of rational people who are doing great things in the world. You know, it's kind of like a collage of interesting people. Yeah. So you, you are a big part of that collage. 
works. Did you know that you were part of a collage? Absolutely. We live in this world. It's a big old collage. It's just a stinking world. <laughs> it, it is a big old second world. But it, but it's interesting. And you and I were talking about it before we came on air. So writing my new book, it, it's amazing to me all the bridging initiatives and organizations mm. that are having this huge impact you know, in the secular world and in the faith-based world worldwide now. But it's just weird. It's you can't find it really in the mainstream media. You've got to dig to find it. But I've and I want to get your take on this. What I've come to decide, and you know, once again, everything I do is spiritual. But I'm like, if you're effectively bridging and bringing people together on common ground, whether it's the media or politics, you're basically taking market share away from the yeah. people who profit 100%. off of keeping us divided. So what's your thoughts on that? I agree with you 100%. I think what we have to do with that knowledge is ask ourselves, well, what stages are we building and what yeah. platforms are we building? Because if if we can't go against that and fight that system, then it's time for us to build new systems. Right. Agreed. Yeah. Our own platforms, our own stages, our own media companies, our own whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah. That's what's going to have to happen. And there's more in us than what we think. It is yeah. possible. It sounds like a big feat, but hey, yeah. we're superhuman. <laughs> no, and, and that's the thing to me is that, you know, we can all make a difference. And mm -hmm. once again, we all have a calling and we all have a purpose. And I can understand it's you and I had a conversation. So um, a couple of weeks back about one of my great passions is mentoring your generation. Because and I always I, get flattered when you say that because you don't realize how old I am. No, but I do. You're 36. I am 36. Yeah. And that's like an elder millennial. Yeah. It's like the old people millennials. No, but. No, it is. But, Go on TikTok and ask them. Yeah, well, I mean, but um, Gen Z millennials, yeah. I mean, it's just I love mentoring yeah. generations behind me. Yeah. But it's because I understand. So I sent you a picture Knowing you were 36 last week of me at 37 campaigning That's for cool. mayor. That's cool. And I'm like, I was taken in the back room and told not to I run, know. that I hadn't paid my dues. And you shared with me an experience you had when you were young in a leadership position when you, you know, came up with a new idea and kind of had it batted back. And that, that just drives me crazy yeah. to see where, I mean, whether it's politics or anything else, people are saying, we need new leadership. Yep. We need young leaders to step yep. up to the plate. And then when young leaders, leaders step up to the plate and they aren't supported, I'm like, what kind of message does that send? I know. But there's there's a beautiful invitation in yeah. this. So there's an invitation on both sides for the leader, the, the, the seasoned professional who's been through it and understands all the loopholes when this young person comes to you and shares this crazy idea. I really believe that it comes from a good heart where it's like, well, I want them to understand yeah. X, Y, Z is not going to work because I've been there. Yeah. And usually we're speaking from a plain, place of pain and brokenness, yep. right? Yep. Instead, the invitation could be, cool, use that experience, use that wisdom, but let's wrap it in a way that says, this is how you can face those roadblocks when you face them. And here's the solution. Yeah. Because then we're pointing kids towards hope and solution and possibility versus a stop sign, right? Yeah. The invitation for the kids, I think, is even when you don't have that affirmation, yeah. that does not mean you can't do it. No. Period. Because we've done it yeah. and it sucks. Mm. Yeah. And it's hard, but it's possible. Well, and that's, to me, you know, I just, I'm so excited about new generations. Absolutely. And I think we all have something to learn from each other, but I'll give you a great example. So when I first started this podcast, um, I had an intern, Molly Eddings. She was a senior at the University of Georgia, or about to start her senior year. So we taped one podcast and Molly is a huge listener of podcasts. She's probably listened to yours. But I said, well, what'd you think? And she was like, yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, what do we need to do better? Yeah. And she told me, and I think the success of this podcast and, and people would be like, you know, what are you doing taking the advice of a 21 year old girl? I'm like, cause she is an avid podcast, li podcast listener. And at that point I wasn't. So she knows more than I do, mm -hmm. and her recommendations made the show that much better. And so we're, you know, as successful as it's become, 
is due in no small part to the advice of a 21 year old girl. What was your biggest takeaway? What she said to you? Um, she, she said, and this is the kiss of death. She said, well, it was interesting. Mm. And I'm like, eh, interesting is good, but interesting isn't just going to cut mm. it. It needs to be entertaining and informative mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. too. So I'm like, I've kind of took that as, ah, you saying it was boring? Yeah. And it probably was. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But I mean, that feedback is so freaking valuable. And it's like, what do we do with feedback as yeah. leaders? Do we take it and be like, so cool. This is some data that I can adjust and pivot. Or it's like, Oh my God, I suck. I shouldn't be podcasting. Right. But, but it's interesting because it's so often I hear younger generations say, we feel like we're being talked over and not to. Absolutely. And I was just reading an article yesterday about CPAC, Mm -hmm. you know, the conservative Republican thing. So the younger conservatives are tired of hearing older conservatives use the term woke. They're like, you know, Mm, all these old white guys just woke this, woke that. And they're like, it's lost its connotation. Mm. So I'm like, well, if you're going to, and they said they think it hurts the Republican Party's ability to recruit the next generation of voters. And I'm like, why would you not be listening at that conference? I mean, I don't know what anybody's politics are out there. I'm happily concerned. I'm happily independent. But I'm like, why would older Republicans who you're going to have to grow the youthful base of your parties to any party to survive? Mm -hmm. And in the midterms, the youth vote went with Democrats based on mainly social issues. But they're not married to either party. Mm -hmm. You know, the majority of them describe themselves as moderate in the polls I've seen. But I'm like, okay, however many 20-something-year-olds you have – at this conference, why not listen to them Mm -hmm. rather than continuing to use this term that they're telling you is going to turn off voters of their generation? Man, that is that I have been thinking so much about, especially since the whole 2020 thing of like this attachment to language and certain words. Like when you say that we're more common than we're not, I completely agree with you. For some reason, there's this just, religious emotional soul attachment to certain Mm. words yeah and the way that you interpret that word and the way i interpret word can be completely different and so then we use that as like okay well we're not the same as opposed to examining well what is that i remember i had a, a good friend of mine i said i think it was the word respect we were talking about something and i said i just don't really feel like through this like you respected me and i meant it meaning the way that I view the word respect. Well, he like lost his stuff, man, like freaked out, like didn't talk to me, like was yelling, like super crazy. And I was like, whoa, like I wasn't that upset about it. I was just like, I just felt he respected me because of X, Y, Z. But I wasn't, for me, it wasn't like a heavy word. Later on, we came back and we sat down and, you know, through a lot of the stuff that he dealt with in the military and some different stuff and language, that word meant like, something completely yeah. different than when I meant it. And it wasn't until that we had that conversation. And the only reason we did is because we were such good friends that we could be honest with each other yeah. about that. But then you think about people you're not in relationship with and they use these words and we immediately make a judgment. It's like, and that's back to the creative bit and the art and stuff like that. It surpasses language a little bit where we can kind of bypass woke and respect and yeah. privilege and some of these other words we get really, really hung up on and we get to the heart of it. And I think if we can and so much easier said than done desire connection and change so much yeah. more than our own attachment to our language. Yeah. We're never going to change. No. Well, and that's, you know, I just, I love having conversations. Yeah. And that's why my wife is like, well, you lost your voice cause you talk too much. I'm like, well, that's fair enough. But it's just sitting face to face with people and having those conversations. Yep. That's how you make those connections. But I think we talked about on your show that, like all the online stuff, you know, I've been attacked online before. I'm sure you probably have been too. You, Tom's. But I'm like, <laughs> the people that are saying that are sitting behind a computer. 100%. And I'm like, if they were sitting here in this room with us, there's no way they wouldn't say there's those no things. Way. And so it's so for nine years in office, I had an open door policy. It was basically, you don't even need an appointment. You know, if I'm not in a meeting, you can come in and yeah. talk to me. So, my vocal critics and cynics, I'm like, I'm not hiding from anybody. 
It's you can come in here, and if you want to say those things to my face, yeah. I'm here. Yeah. But it's just it's so much easier to throw rocks from a computer screen when you're relatively anonymous. Mm-hmm. But I just, but that is, you know, for you to have conversations with the interesting people you bring on and just you're building a fabric and creating a web that I think is contributing. And hopefully this is too, and just the podcast community to further strengthening, you know, the fabric of our community. I think that's, I agree with how do we get unity back? How do we heal the nation? We've got to start our own deals. I mean, it's, it's, you're not going to, and I've said this, I'm like, politicians are not going to heal the nation because politics are divisive yep. by nature yep. and you've got a winner and you've got a loser. That is not the way you heal, yeah. you know? So, but working together in the sectors and the spaces that we do, I, I know that we can heal the nation. Amen. By creating. By creating. And not saying others oh, too many. No. Get over that because God's a creator and he designed us to be creators. So, unapologetically create more stuff. Yeah. Well, yep. I mean, yep. so I'm, I'm so psyched to go to Austin. To so cool. Southwest I'm so jealous. Because I'm like, I know <sighs> that I'm going to meet so many stinking creative, awesome people. You that, better be networking. You oh, I, be. I, I, hopefully I'll have my voice back by then. But yes, I will be, <laughs> I will be shilling. Ooh, look at that <laughs> web term. Tell me what shilling is. Shilling is the, I, I analyze it. <laughs> I think it's chill selling is maybe where it came from. Nice. Shilling. UrbanDictionary.com. Yeah. You is, probably Googled is, that. Is selling. That's nice. To the You're right. 100%. creatives and techno kids yeah. and all. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never heard of it until I was on Twitter. I was really heavily involved in Twitter last year when the whole Web3 NFT stuff was really hot. And everybody's like, what do you want to shill out? And I'm like, what <laughs> are you saying? So it's just market. Yeah. But chill, chill marketing. Well, you know, but that's to me in bridging efforts and everything. Yeah. I'm always like, I think you need a translator at times <laughs> and I could see it in community redevelopment. That's what I served as during my time in office. I could speak the language of people in affordable, low income neighborhoods yeah. or speak yeah. the language, but it's, it's contextually, you got it. So I can throw out shill because I actually put some thought into what it means. But it's like you say with woke, that's a catchphrase know, know. and, you know, or privilege that there's so many people that just throw it out there. And I'm like, if you add, can you use it contextually? Mm-hmm. And if you can't, you're going to end up having people going, yeah, this old white guy saying woke, that just yeah. doesn't resonate yeah. with me at all. But I love to be a translator and to be able to speak different languages and to be that go between between people Mm -hmm. because it's not everybody has that capability, but Mm -hmm. it is, it's when things like context that furthers the divide, it does not help bridge the divide. That's a great tip. Add context. Add context. So are you learning today? I'm learning a lot. I'm I'm learning from you too. Learned a hot tip. I'm, I'm learning that I can go 40, 30, 45 minutes on this voice. So if I never get it back. You don't it, need it. it I don't Look. need it. It'll just be unique. As long That's as it. I can continue to push That's it out it. there. But I think I told you at the beginning, I had a speech coach. She's like in the World Speaking Hall of Fame. That's cool. And she said, um, in speaking, and I would say in communicating in general, mm. it's about connection, not perfection. Absolutely. And so it's kind of like... I look at it, I like imperfections because I think they're cool because then you know it's original. Yeah. So I like yeah. old albums when you're listening and there's an outtake or something and you're like, that, that wasn't supposed to be there. Yeah. But you know that's just impromptu or unplanned. I think it's just that puts a special mark on things. I agree. Sometimes just keep in the imperfections. Don't edit it out. I do yeah. that with podcasting sometimes. Every once in a while, just to get a glimpse of like, hey, Heather's a human, like a little kid coming in. Mommy, can I have some water? I'm yeah. like, hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you, um, there was a recent documentary released about the Beeble, Beatles, mm-hmm. um, Let It Be. Mm-hmm. So it was about their recording of their last album. And uh, I mean, just the outtakes were unbelievable. But I'll use that as an example for you too, because I put something out on Instagram and we'll start to wind it up, but uh, 
but I'm like, okay, people say that young people can't change the world. The Beatles were all in their 20s when they broke up. Yeah. I'm like, do not tell me that young people cannot change the world. I mean, three kids out of Seattle, Washington, Nirvana, they changed the world of music. So all these things can change, mm -hmm. but you have to have people willing to step up to the plate to try to change them, which is what you're doing and why you're such an inspiration to me and so many other people. And stay the same quirky girl that you are now because yes, that's what connects people. That's what connects me to you. I, I grew up feeling like an outsider too, yeah. but it's, but it's interesting. And I thought about it through my faith. I'm like, I, you know, I don't have to fit in because I belong and belonging is a lot better than fit, fitting in. Sometimes to fit in, you have to compromise yourself. You have to pretend like you're somebody else and put on a mask belonging. You're accepted and you don't have to worry about doing that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's focusing on the belonging and not the fitting in. That's and you belong. Yes, I do. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, as we get towards the end, there's always the two questions I want to ask, but where can people find Heather Parody? Um, Other than right here in the studio right now. Google Heather Parody. I'm on all platforms except for Snapchat because I don't get it. Um, I know that's very old person of me, but everywhere at Heather Parody. Okay. Yeah. Well, cool. And in your life, what puts a smile on your face and brings joy to your heart regularly. Well, I mean, come on. You can't ask a mom that. You can't. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 wow. I really like how kids really bring you down to present moment Yeah. all the time. Yep. And the biggest deal to them is like just the smallest little thing and the attention that they put on these tiny little moments. So like I could be like going through like this existential <clears throat> crisis of like, where am I heading in my life? Where's this going? <laughs> like, how am I going to do all this? And I can be deep in this thought and with my journals and books and, you know, whatever. And then my kid can come in and just be like, look at this strawberry. It looks like a butt. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's just like, it does. And it's yeah. so funny and it's cute. And you just have, I love how kids just bring it back to this simple little tiny things and just wake us up out of our drama. Well, that's like my, my nephew who's in his 20s now. But when he was a kid, he asked my sister, he's like, Mama, is Jesus cool? Mm. And my sister was like, yeah, you know, I think Jesus is cool. She got, and he goes, does he ride a motorcycle? And I'm like, that's cute. that, cause that's what he thought cool was. If you, yeah. yes, Jesus probably did ride a motorcycle. He wore his helmet though. Or he would. Yes. And he, he wore his would. helmet. Well, Heather, thank you for being with me. I just look forward to this was fun. Thank continuing you. the dialogue as Let's always. Go. It is a pleasure to hang with you. We'll do it again. Dropping the mic all the time we got and we are out. Yeah. Hey guys, thanks for listening to or watching the Changemaker podcast today greatly appreciate it. If you're listening and you want to see the video, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel at Deke Copenhaver. That's a pretty, pretty easy to remember, I would think. But really, we also want to remind you to like, subscribe, rate across all platforms, download. And if you're looking for a coach, a speaker, or anything, you know where to find me. Just email me at me at deekcopenhaver.com. And thanks so much for listening.